Hello, Ms. Holbert's class. I hope you guys are having a great day. My name is Sean Anderson. I'm a conservation biologist. Now I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about uh, what I do for a living and my career. And in so doing, I'll tell you a little bit about what conservation biology is and give you some examples of that. I'm a professor at a university in California called California State University Channel Islands. So I started my professional career as a marine biologist, that's me underwater, and, and I spent many years underwater. Now I work both underwater and on land. And so you'd now refer to me as a conservation biologist. Um, uh, even though some people try to impersonate me like this crazy guy, Josh Hutcherson, that, that uh, played a character named after me in a movie, um, uh, mostly what I do is um, not uh, in the limelight. I do a lot of stuff uh, that people don't see. I do this stuff all over the planet. Uh, these are all the places uh, where I work. Uh, the places in, in bright red are the places I currently work. Um, so I work everywhere from uh, the tropics to California, which is where most of my work is, and then elsewhere around the planet. Now, I don't have anything in Texas where you guys are, but uh, I do have a lot of work in Louisiana, which is kind of close to Texas. Um, and these are all places that I do conservation work. Why do we need conservation? A couple two, uh, key things. First and foremost, there's more and more people on the planet. There's a lot of people and we need a lot of resources. And so the more people causes more challenges to our natural world. Not only are there more people, but um, we use a lot of resources per person, particularly in places like the United States. So we really uh, intensively consume parts of the natural world and that leads to challenges. So what I do as a conservation biologist, basically my, my work breaks down to three different parts. Firstly, I ask, is there a problem? And if there is a problem, um, I, I try to figure out what caused the problem and then to work on stopping the cause of that problem. Once we've stopped the bleeding, once we've stopped the, 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 the thing that's causing the issue, oftentimes we have damage. We have fewer animals, we have pollution in the water, what have you. So then I work on trying to repair that damage. And all three parts of these are uh, different elements that conservation biology addresses. Sometimes uh, to do our work, we have to look way back in time. Um, for example, what was going on during the Roman Empire, for example. Other times we look back, uh, back in time, but maybe not quite as far back. So this is um, some work where we're looking at how people behaved uh, about 100 years ago. In this case, uh, in Hawaii, and, and, and looking at how people surfed and how that influenced um, the natural world. And then we measure things right now, today. Um, all over the place, measure plants, measure animals, etc. Mostly, uh, I and my, my students and my colleagues, we work in the field. So we make maps. This thing on the right is a map that was created by flying a robot over the ground and creating a high-resolution model of, of critters. Um, we work all over the place in the field. We also work in the laboratory. So um, we'll take things from the field, bring them into the lab, and look at them under microscopes, count them, do things of that nature. My lab also develops a lot of technology. We vet a lot of technology. We try out a lot of new tools. Um, we're very poor, so we invent things. We, we hack things together. So for example, this is one of our virtual reality goggles built out of a welding helmet. We also are always learning. So even though I'm a, I'm a doctor, I have a PhD, I'm always learning every day, and so are my students. And so this is an example of some of our field work. This is out in, in the South Pacific, and we're building uh, robots to go to swim under the water to, to look at coral and things, and they're always breaking. So we have to constantly be fixing things. Um, we also build a lot of stuff. So even though I'm a scientist, I spend a lot of times in metal shops and Home Depot and places like that. In this case, we're building some um, uh, fences for an experiment in the Middle East. Um, we also do a lot of sharing of our insights. So we share our work with uh, students. We share our work with um, uh, government leaders, etc. We work with a lot of people. This is my students speaking to a mayor um, that just had been uh, hit with a hurricane. And so we're trying to understand what, what he needs. Overall, um, we talk about 
conservation um, and, and, and threats to our environment, things fall out into pretty much four large categories. One is over harvesting, taking too many things, too many trees, too many bears, whatever. Invasive species, that's the introduction of critters, organisms that aren't supposed to be there, but we've, we've accidentally or intentionally put them in a new place. Uh, and then there's destruction or fragmentation of our ecosystem. So that's where we take a grassland, pave it over, turn into a, a parking lot or something of that nature. Pollution is where we put out material, energy, chemicals, et cetera, um, that, that cause problems. So all of our work touches on one or more of these things. Real quickly, I'll run through a couple examples of uh, things we work, we've worked on about animal populations and how they've been disappearing. These are some uh, wolf cubs that were brought to us in, uh, in this case, this is in the Middle East. This is near in Turkey, near the Iranian border. Over there is an, an ibex that had been killed by someone is on their porch. So we work on uh, understanding how many critters there are. So this is a project where we're, we're tagging grizzly bears and um, putting radio collars around them so we can watch how they move and understand how they move and then therefore create better parks and protections for them so they don't um, so they're safe and people are safe and it's actually a lot of fun so in this case this is this bear is tranquilized right after this he's going to wake up and and run back in the forest uh, we work on a lot of iconic critters this is what's called a california condor and so you can see over here this is what this is how big a condor is with a group of elementary school kids holding it up hugely important to our native people's to um, our, our sense of who we are in California. Condors are on our quarter. Um, uh, huge, they used to be all over the place. This is a map of the US in the Pleistocene, so about, say, about 20,000 years ago. And this light green is all the territory of California condors. So they stretch from you guys in Texas up to New York, up to Seattle, all over the place. Starting with um, uh, various changes in the environment, and humans arriving on in, into North America, we started seeing fewer condors. So by 2,000 years ago, condors were not around where you guys are, were not around on the East Coast. By the 1800s, when Lewis and Clark went across the U.S. and, and first documented condors right over here, they were only found on the, um, the West Coast of the U.S., and by 1979, they were only found where my university is in, in Ventura County, California. Uh, by 1980, we were down to only about 20 individuals alive in the wild. So we went from thousands and thousands of birds to just a, a few, and we captured the last of them, brought them all into captivity. So by the late 80s, there were no more condors alive in the wild. We took them into zoos, we worked on breeding them, and, and started releasing them what's called captive, uh, captive rearing, and it's worked fantastically well. So we now have almost a thousand condors now all across California, Arizona, Mexico, et cetera. So the fantastic conservation success story. We've had similar success with things like mountain lions, um, and we are working to make sure that other critters don't have uh, as big a problem. So in this case, this is some work we're doing with manta rays in Hawaii. And so this is what it looks like when you dive in the water with manta rays, huge things, really, really cool. And we're uh, uh, exploring, understanding how people can come and tour these, see these folks. So pay local folks money so the local folks get money and uh, protect the manta rays so that we don't have to fish them, kill them. We can, the local people can earn a living from a healthy population of uh, manta rays or other animals, and we call this ecotourism. Uh, one last example of the kind of things we work on, we also work on things like pollution. And so, for example, we do a lot with plastic pollution. This is an ad from the 1950s where everybody thought plastics are great. This thing right here is one of the first instruments we created to make plastics, modern plastics, uh, over a hundred years ago. So for a while we were just making plastics. We thought they were great. They're awesome. All kinds of good stuff. But we've realized in recent years that we've made so much plastic, it's just getting out into the environment and it's causing all kinds of problems. This is a picture from the Pacific Ocean of just random plastic floating around. So it's a huge problem. The large plastic breaks down into what we call microplastic or small pieces of plastic, like the size of your hair or so, um, and causes all kinds of problems. Um, 
we see that people really like to use plastic. And in fact, during the COVID pandemic, we've actually used more plastic. So when we survey people, um, about half people that we ask say they use, they're using more plastic now than before the pandemic. And only about 20% or one fifth of people say they're using less. So we seem to always be using more and more plastic. There's so much plastic on the planet now that it's actually in our air. So this is some work that my lab has been doing and we've been measuring how much plastic is just in the air that we breathe. And it turns out there's actually way more microplastics in the air. What does this mean? This isn't good, but, but what does this mean for us? We're not entirely sure. We're still measuring this stuff. So a lot of conservation um, is also figuring out unknown things, figuring out brand new challenges. How can we understand what the problem is? How can we stop the problem? How can we fix the problem? Uh, when we're done with this, we communicate this to, uh, to all kinds of people. We talk to the media um, and we talk to people like politicians. In this case, this is the mayor of Los Angeles. And in this case, this is Los Angeles. Now you guys in Texas might not think of this as being Los Angeles, but this is the Los Angeles River. And so we're working on, um, uh, another example of things we're working on is, is trying to restore habitat, restore rivers and grasslands, et cetera, to be in a more natural state and a healthy state that's better for people and better for nature. Um, we do this, I do this a whole variety of ways, but including classes just like yours. So we bring students like you guys out to the field. We, we monitor, we do all kinds of uh, fun stuff. Conservation is awesome. Conservation is a fantastic career and would love to talk more about this and love to hear any questions you guys have for me. Thanks so much. And uh, hope you guys have a better understanding of what conservation biology is. Thanks.